Good evening there. My name is Lemonjai, and this is the nation today. Thank you for joining me on my show tonight. Multi-million Dallas's mask inaugurated at the State House. We have a report for you on that. But that was for the bad luck for UDP strongman, the commando, Modo Sabali, as the High Court sided with the Independent Electoral Commission in saying that the Independent Electoral Commission is, was in fact right in rejecting Mr. Sabali's nomination there. Bankamane will be my guest. He will assist me to go through some of the day's events. Um, and we have other stories also for you. But first. Thank you for joining me. So my take tonight will be on Momodu Sabali. It would appear that his encounter with misfortune is showing no sign of easing. On Friday, that is today, High Court Judge Francis Achibonga sided with the Independent Electoral Commission and said the commission is right in rejecting his nomination to stand as a candidate in the upcoming National Assembly elections. He then dismissed his lawsuit against the IEC for want of merit. But what is the root cause of all of this? Well, it was in 2017 when the borough administration, government, set up the Jane Commission to probe uh, former President Yaya Jame for corruption, and that commission held that Sabali helped Jame pilfer the nation's money. A lifetime ban from pub holding public office was recommended for him. The government went ahead to implement that. When Sabali went to the IEC to file his nomination, the IEC specifically rejected Sabali's application for nomination on the basis of Section 91E of the Constitution that, and I quote, no person is qualified for election as a member of the National Assembly if he or she has been found by a report of a commission or committee of inquiry, uh, the proceedings of which are I have or have been held and published in accordance with the relevant law to be incompetent to hold public office by reason of having acquired assets unlawfully as assets unlawfully or defrauded or, or defrauded the state or misused or abused his or her office or willfully acted in a manner prejudicial to the interests of the state and the fi findings have not been set aside on appeal or judicial review. The High Court has now said that the IEC was or is spot on. So what next for Sabali? Well, last year I wrote an op-ed where I stated Sabali joined UDP in the hope that the party was going to win the presidential election. I had correctly predicted that the UDP would lose the election. And if the party did, people such as Sabali would or might leave the party. I had said that I did not see Sabali being in opposition for another five years. Maybe I am wrong, going by the recent developments. In any case, time will surely tell. It's actually been too many problems for one man, really. From getting banned from holding public office for life, to a shock electoral loss, to getting blocked from running as an NP, this is not a good time for Sabali at all. Sabali is a very religious uh, man too. Every now and then he would say a verse of God to represent situations that befall him. But given all of the mishaps that have befallen him lately, maybe it's time really for him to calm down and go on some self-reflection work. Now we all, for, me, for my take tonight, uh, we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. So a multi-million Dallas's mask was inaugurated today at the State House. Uh, Star TV editor-in-chief, Justice uh, Momodo Justice Dabo, was there. He was among worshippers uh, while the mosque was being inaugurated. And he came through with this report. 
The construction of this beautiful edifice began in 2018, but its progress was slowed down due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It was built through the instrumentality of UAE Aid, Dar Albert Society and Taiba Charity Center. Speaking at the inaugural ceremony, the Imam Rotib of Banjul al Haj Chernomas Corps thanked the donors for their continued support to the propagation of Islam. The Minister of Religious Affairs, Honorable Musa Drame, expressed delight for witnessing the inauguration of the newly built State House Mosque following several months of hard work. Minister Drame described the structure as magnificent before entreating its sponsors to widen their scope of interventions to other areas such as water security, orphans, poor and the less privileged. The president of the State House Mosque Committee, Sheikh Lamenture, reminded Muslims that they are saddled with a huge responsibility of providing support to each other. The president of Supreme Islamic Council, Sheikh Esa Dabo, said though Islam is not a novelty in the Gambia, it's heartwarming to know that the Gambian leader is passionate about the religion. Representing the sponsors, Yusuf Abdullah Aysad expressed appreciation to Allah for giving them faith to help in the construction of places of worship. Aysad said they are going at full stretch to support the poor and needy across the globe and that their interventions are inspired by Islamic brotherhood and goodness to the human family. He added that Del Albert Society has been fruitfully collaborating with UAE authorities to render humanitarian assistance to the poor and needy, adding that the organization's four decades of operations has seen the construction of mosques in various parts of the globe. <laughs> والتي وضعت نصف عينيها عمارة بيوت الله تعالى في الأرض قاطبة. أكو إلى أن كفوني أي دوكو كما سكيرو دوكو كنا نبدا سجلتنا نبيلين. بري نعمل دي كأرض بمول لدلا أن كيني عندي كبرياني. President Baro, meanwhile, said the construction of the mosque was a gesture that can be adequately compensated only by Allah. This edifice is alluring and magnificent. This mosque will ease worship and will attract those not even so enthusiastic about congregational prayers, the president said. The Gambian leader recognized that though the donors are physically far away in other parts of the globe, they are emotionally attached to the Gambia. He also recognized and appreciated the fiscal discipline exercised throughout the project's implementation. President Barrow, meanwhile, urged the donors to spread their tentacles to other areas such as health and education. <laughs> especially tertiary education. According to the Gambian leader, the mosque is not only splendid, but will be also enjoying and help Islam flourish. The reporting for Star TV News, this is Momodou Dabo. Welcome back. So it has been another dramatic and disappointing day for the United Democratic Party as Momodou Sabali got his case dismissed by the High Court for want of merit. More in this report there by Binta Koli. Sabali sued the Independent Electoral Commission and the Attorney General arguing that the rejection of his nomination to context in the upcoming National Assembly election was not done in accordance with the law. He wants the court to quash the decision of the IEC in order to accord him the chance to context in the Busimbala constituency. In a courtroom filled with Sabali supporters and well-wishers with tight security, George Achiboga ruled that the Independent Electoral Commission was right in rejecting the nomination of Sabali. Speaking to the press shortly after the ruling, Momodo Sabali urged his supporters to exercise calm and patience, adding that he will not let the borough administration suppress his constitutional right and that he will lace with his lawyer and party leader to see a way forward. 
if listeners could recall, IEC rejects the nomination of Modu Sabali on the 10th of March 2020, an aspirant for Busumbala constituency. Under the United Democratic Party ticket based on Section 90, Subsection 1, Paragraph E of the 1997 Constitution. For Star TV News, I am Bintokul. Elsewhere, the Gambia Ports Authority has interdicted an additional five employees regarding the corruption, corruption scandal that has hit the authority. More in this report by Awasane. Following social media's report regarding the interdiction of some employees of Gambia Port Authority under the traffic operations, Gambia Port Authority spokesperson Yankubamane told Star TV that some staff members, both male and female, were interdicted over the week following a board meeting on Tuesday. Two more supervisors of the delivery and implementation unit have also been placed under suspension, bringing the entire list of interdiction officials to nine since reports of the fraud first surfaced. Mane confirmed the report to be accurate. Um, the, the I mean, the Wednesday, last Wednesday, uh, interdiction of five uh, staff uh, has increased the, the interdicted staff number to nine. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah, the previously, the body called that uh, we, when the matter, the whole matter came up on social media, uh, it, uh, management has swiftly reacted uh, by, sus I mean, you know, uh, by suspending or uh, interdicting four female staff. Okay. Uh, following, we are following the preliminary report that uh, management received uh, because uh, they were suspected uh, in the saga, down in, in the scandal. So uh, just last Wednesday, following the board, uh, board meeting on Tuesday, mm -hmm. uh, board also recommended for uh, the additional research for the people to be interdicted. So on Wednesday, they were officially interdicted. So that has actually been number to nine. He added that the management of both GPA and the Traffic Operations Unit have reacted to the irresponsible act. However, regarding the measures taken to avoid such acts, he said, What we can say, since uh, we have also, you know, uh, you know invite, uh, invited the police to help in the foreign investigation to accept the, uh, the actual amount involved, um, we cannot for certain say anything more for now, but uh, the matter, uh, according to the internal report, is, uh, there is a suggestion that uh, uh, the fraud may have, may have occurred. But that also report also did not say, contrary to what was said on the social media, that uh, the receipts were duplicated. The internal report did not mention any, anything of that sort. Rather, it says that uh, you know, payments uh, made outside our port system. Okay, and then that does, that does, uh, the outside the port system, but it does not necessarily mean that this is where I duplicated because uh, the report did not show anything of that. So meaning that is contrary to what was said on the social media. PRO Mane said this is an allegation in the meantime, but their internal investigation is in progress, adding that he can't say much until when the reports are out. According to Yankoba Mane, their management is very strict about the measures taken and will determine to get the bottom of the matter, adding that sanctioning their own investigation is also something that will affirm the commitment of the management on the matter. Meanwhile, when he was asked how they found out about the corruption, he said they normally did an annual analysis of revenue collection and things were not going normal. That's where they discovered that something was wrong somewhere. The suspended individuals include the rating manager, assistant rating manager, and assistant delivery and documentation manager. For Star TV News, I am Awasane. Now, the Minister of Transport, Works and Infrastructure has introduced a new route license scheme for commercial vehicles. This scheme, according to the Ministry, seeks to stop the double payment of fares by passengers and overall improve the transport system in the country. Mariam Dem reports. Transportation has been a major challenge in the Gambia recently, as a day hardly passes by without commuters complaining of paying double or triple fares, which are supposed to be a one-route fare or traffic congestion for a long time now. 
Well, in this regard, the government, through the Ministry of Transport, has taken a step to address the dilemma. The ministry on Tuesday announced a new route scheme that will ensure drivers put stickers with numbers issued by the ministry on their cars to address the issue. The scheme, according to the ministry, shall apply to commercial vehicles that are licensed to carry 10 passengers and above. Registration to obtain the permit and stickers started on Wednesday, 38 March 2022, at various garages such as Banjur, Sarakunda, Tipa Garage, Bursubi, Costa Road, and Brikama. The official launching of the scheme is scheduled for Monday, 4 April 2022. The ministry urged all drivers to comply to ensure the active implementation of the scheme. Meanwhile, the vehicles running within the following areas are subjected to the scheme. Banjul to Westfield, Banjul to Burkama, Banjul to Bakau, Banjul to Sarakunda, Banjul to Tipa Garage, Banjul to Tabokoto, Westfield to Tabokoto, Westfield to Banjulinding, Westfield to Burkama, Westfield to Costa Road, Westfield to Bakau, Tabokoto to Burkama, Lamen to Burkama, Burkama to Costa Road, Burkama to Tone Table, Sarakunda to Tabokoto, Sarakunda to Costa Road, Sarakunda to Banjulinding, Sarakunda to Birkama, Sarakunda to Bakau, and Sarakunda to Terminal. Maria Madam reporting for Star TV News. Now, in fulfillment of his demand, uh, the Ministry of Defense, in partnership with the Veterans Association, presented a vehicle to one of the World War II veterans, Ibu Jangha, who is uh, 102 years old. That's how old. Mr. Jangha is. More in this report. The donors also include Ja Oil Company, Nawek, Gambia Ports Authority, Social Security, and other institutions. Ibu Jangha did not only receive a vehicle, but also a token of $10,000. Minister of Defense Sheikh Omar Fai shows appreciation and thank his staff for the job well done. Ibrahim Akambi is the president of Gaf Veterans Association. Because I was going to give Thanks to everybody who participated in giving us something as veterans. Like somebody said here, we serve the nation. And anywhere you go to, they will tell you, the only person who can tell you what war is like and what peace is like is the veteran. Because he's done the war and now he's in a peaceful society, so he's done both. Once you've done that, you become a veteran. And uh, there is this saying also we always say, you are either a veteran or a veg. And we all know what a veg is, vegetable. You are either a vet or a veg. If you don't become a vet and become a vegetable, you'll be consumed. Because vegetables are for consumption only. So thank you very much for having this idea, Madam Senor, and uh, the PS coming up with this fantastic idea. When I was called, I was overwhelmed. I thought we are alone. I thought we are lonely. All of a sudden, this call came and said, look, Armed Forces Veterans Association. Speaking at the presentation, CDS Yankova A. Drame said, Under adverse conditions, more so in the context of the Second World War, volunteered to say we would want to serve in uniform so that the peace that we enjoy or we cherished can flourish so that all of us can live our dreams in peace and harmony. Therefore, it is proper and fitting that we acknowledge and commend the exceptional sacrifices those who volunteer to serve in uniform so that this world and this country, to be more precise, can flourish. Veterans, we cannot thank you enough for those exceptional sacrifices you made. So that today we, have li we live in a free world that is characterized by peace and dignity. Without those sacrifices, perhaps, it would have been a different world. So, to acknowledge that exceptional sacrifice from individuals, in my view, is proper and fitting, and we must celebrate it. CDS Drama said this donated vehicle will go a long way in elevating requirements in the context of transportation and transaction to be undertaken by the beneficial on a day-to-day -day basis. CDS grabbed the opportunity to thank those who served in uniform and are still alive for their sacrifice and service to their nation.
Fatu Senghor, the CEO of Fatima's Trading, brings the idea of the initiative and said her bond with GAF is way stronger now than ever. The eldest of the veterans, Pa Osman Jai, was also given a token of appreciation, which was collected by his son, P. On Jai Jr., and he thanked the donors on behalf of his father. For Star TV News, I am Awasane. Welcome back. So now we'll get to the inter interview part of my show tonight. Well, uh, the National Assembly elections uh, are upon us, but also today, the, this major event was the High Court's decision to dismiss the case of uh, UDP's Mouro Sabale there for lack of merit. Bangamane joins me tonight. He will be my uh, guest on the show tonight, one-on-one -on -one with him, independent analyst. So we will be talking about some of these things, really. Uh, the cost of living, all of that, really. Um, I know there has been a lot of movement in terms of the candidates. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Mane, thank you for joining me my show. I'm I appreciate glad, it. I'm glad to be here, I mean, as always. I mean, UDP has <laughs> struggled. They have struggled since the shock electoral loss in December 2021 to now. It initially, it was the party that went to court claiming that the election was rigged. It was stolen. They lost. I mean, in fact, the court did not entertain the, 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 the case because of some technical procedural issue. Now you have Sabale rejected by the IEC. I mean, he, he went to court, backed by his party. Today, the court is saying that the IEC was right. What are the takeaways for you? Uh, like I've always said, uh, Lyman, before, and that is that this is the, we should celebrate these kinds of stuff because it looks like everybody is relying on the law, mm -hmm. which is basically the rule of law that mm -hmm. prevails. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, those who are aggrieved, you know, literally Section 5 of our Constitution gives them right to go to a court of competent jurisdiction to seek redress, and uh, which is what literally the UDP is doing and Mumu Sabal is doing. So that should be, that's very, very commendable. It's showing that our democracy is maturing uh, to where we are not really just yelling at each other on the streets, but we are literally going to the right forum to address these issues. Unfortunately, I mean, obviously, as you rightly said, they've lost these cases and they should see it for what it is. That the courts have interpreted the laws as they are written and as they are. And that the law, it just happens that this case just, um, you know, did not go their way. I mean, based on those interpretations and based on what the Constitution really intended, if you will. So, I mean, I think they can be proud of themselves for relying on the law and encouraging uh, their supporters to really follow the due process of the law, because that's the kind of country we want. I'm sure, you know, with these things you'll win some, you'll lose some, but at least the country remains and it keeps going in the direction that it needs to go. And that should be the ultimate goal of everybody, including the, the political parties. So this is, a, this is commendable and it's, it's really a great day for our democracy. Yet again, people go, go to the courts and the courts come back with their verdict and everybody respecting that verdict. I think that is uh, wonderful for our democracy. You, you, you're talking about the institution that, and the fact that people can really rely on these institutions. But do you think at all that UDP trusted these institutions? Because today, the party was led by I mean, the deputy leader, Ajiam Seka, and some of the claims or comments that she made was that what former President Ajame was doing in the country are the same exact stuff or things that the current president, Alema Baro, is trying to bring back. I mean, look, UDP is an opposition party. So obviously, yes, they will call the government every name in the books, and they will call the president every name in the books. Mm -hmm. They are well within their rights to criticize Barrow. Whether that criticism is justified or not, it doesn't really, it's not the point. The point is, Ajayam Seka is doing what opposition parties do, and that is to scold the government, and sometimes when things don't go their way, call the government uh, uh, all kinds of names and insist that the government is not democratic or what have you. So it's, it's a matter of opinion. Obviously, if you ask somebody else on the other aisle <laughs> of the divide, mm -hmm. they will have a whole different take on this. They will yes. tell you, well, the world is the most democratic, he's this, he's that. So these are all happening within a democratic culture that we are trying to inculcate. So it's great. And as far as the opinion itself, whether I agree with her or disagree with her, I tend to kind of shy away from that because that's not the issue. I really want us to focus on the basis here, on the issue here, which is uh, our democracy. Uh, but what, what, I, what I was trying to get at is mm. that 
you are saying the P citizens can trust the system, the democratic institutions. Absolutely. But you have the UDP. They are thrown into these institutions, but they will come back and complain and say, uh, oh, it is Adam Abbara who is, I mean, I mean, they are working on orders. Look, I mean, uh, that, that's, <laughs> if, if that's what you are referring to, I don't believe that one bit. Yes. I don't believe that uh, uh, these Supreme Court justices or High Court justices are being influenced. we have right now mm -hmm. can be bought or and sold or threatened or... Uh, you know, what have you. I don't believe that one bit. Now, these so cases, they are working independently. Absolutely. I, I strongly, strongly, strongly have strong faith in these justices that we have currently in our judicial system. I really do. Um, but again, that's what I, why I was saying opposition parties can, you know, do what opposition parties do. Call the government every name in the books, accuse them of everything, everything on, the, on earth. Whether that's justified or not, whether it's, you know, really true or false, that's a whole different ballgame. But look, UDP has won cases here. Yeah, Kumbagete case was a political, a heavily political, political case. Political case. She, she's, she was fired from the parliament by Barrow because she uh, was leaning UDP. Mm -hmm. Period. There is no ifs and buts yes. about it. We cannot assume what could, what may, what was, what did, what didn't. No. The reality was, it was a, a totally political case. Now, such a highly political case where Barrow fires her, putting somebody that was supposed to be his own surrogate, and the, the courts coming back and saying, no, Barrow, you can't do this, and then bringing her back to parliament. Now, I mean, what do you call that? Is that because of judicial interference? By, I mean, what I'm saying is, look, some cases will be won by UDP, some cases will be lost by them, just like it always happens elsewhere. Um, so in cases where they have lost, uh, you know, it's okay. They can say the, the, the ruling was not fair and that borrow this, borrow that. I get that. But as an independent observer of these issues, I think most uh, observers will conclude that this is just a judicial process and a fair one at that and that the ju justices look at the merits of the case because even to a layman, um, legal layman person that is. Yes. This case from the get go, even ourselves our, on our program, for the people, people <laughs> we call this one out. Yes. We did. We said that section ninety, uh, section, sorry, section one e, e disqualifies Momodi Sabali. Is because the so, so, so would you say that Sabali gambled on his feet? He gambled then yes, I, by going and then so, to the IEC to say that in fact, we were, I am looking for a job when we, you are not qualified. When we were encouraging him on, in that same program, during that same program, we were even encouraging him to go to the courts. Because you have to understand these issues have to be challenged in the courts. Because it is only the Supreme Court and the High Court that have the sole jurisdiction when it comes to matters of interpretation of the Constitution. They are the only ones. Yes. So if you have issues of this nature, it is advisable and in fact it is good practice to go to those institutions and then demand redress. They will interpret it for us. Now the, that, that what essentially it's going to do is it's going to enrich our jurisprudence. That is now we have a precedence. We have a case. Our case law is being enriched. So now, if somebody has a same case, future the same cases, impeach, it would be I, I much easier for, for, the, Thank you. The, for the judges to, to decide on them. Even only the judges, but even the attorneys, the parties, the And even the members of the public. Absolutely. They know now yes. what this is all about, and that if you fall in this category, what the, the law says about that. This is good. This is really good. Otherwise, it's really open to you and I, the, the, the regular guys, our own interpretation. Which wouldn't hold any water. But but but, but then but then come to think of you are saying that even the Liverpool people, I mean, they knew that there was no case for Sabali. Absolutely. But then you have lawyers. There was a bitter legal battle among the country's lawyers. You have a lot of, I mean, lawyers galore in UDP. You have all these lawyers who are insisting that the IEC had no right. To reject Sabali, they ha the, the issue of interpretation is not their business. No, they are doing what lawyers do. They are doing what they would need to do for their client, so that they can get paid. Not necessarily get paid, but I'm just saying they are just doing their job. <laughs> yes. Because uh, let me put it, even murderers, 
they get lawyers representing them, right? Yes. And what do those lawyers do? They go out there and try to create uh, uh, what we call reasonable doubt yes. in the court as far as their client is concerned. To find a way of getting their, right, yeah. their, their, their client out of trouble. Absolutely. Could it possibly be somebody else who murdered this person? You guys may have gotten the wrong man or the wrong woman. I mean, what I'm saying is they are just doing what lawyers do and what they are supposed to do. And that is to try to build a case for their client and say, look, his case has merit and that these guys should not be disqualified. And they have to try to pull, uh, I would say, uh, relevant provisions in the Constitution to even back up their point. Because, you know, you cannot just also go to court without pulling the provisions that you are relying on. Because it's like me saying, hey, my rights are violated. If I just go to the Supreme Court claiming my rights are violated, the Supreme Court cannot really rule on that. Because, but because that I is have, nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, because I have to pull the, the, the relevant provision in the Constitution that was actually violated. Because this is law. You have to pull the specific provision and say, hey, section 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 of the, provi of the Constitution of the Gambia uh, says this, and these guys did this to me, so they violated that provision of the Constitution. So otherwise, the courts cannot rule on that. They cannot, interp they cannot tell you, me, whether my rights were violated or not. For my rights to be violated, there has to be a provision in the Constitution that has been violated, that actually forbids that action to take place. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So in this regard, they will also have to do exactly that. Whether you agree with that provision that they are quoting or not, is totally moot. At the end of the day, that's what the courts are there for. They will look at these things and hear their argument and then rule on it, which is what they have done. So kudos to everybody and to our country that our democracy is maturing. Let, let's talk yeah. about the issue of selective justice then. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue of Kumba Amdei, Kumba Amundei. I mean, I have heard it time and again. Uh, UDP people saying, oh, Mamburenjai, oh, Alaji Sisa is working. President Baro has let these people to continue to work, even when they, they, they were also adversely mentioned, in the, in, indicted by the Jada Commission report, and he doesn't want Mamur Sabali to work. What is your view on this? No, but see, what about him doesn't work in, within a legal framework like this? It just doesn't work. Because at the end of the day, look, let's wait until uh, Mamburinjai tries to run for office for parliament. And but he's in public office. No, 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 uh, yes. no. No, yes. you have to understand. Yes. When, you see, uh, I think uh, people are convoluting two issues here. Uh, yes. <laughs> Go on. Yes. The Mamoudi Sabali case, as it stands right now, yes. is that Mamoudi Sabali is trying to run for a National Assembly seat. Yes. Okay? Yes. That is exactly what, and the IEC, that is the referee of this process. Mm -hmm. It's their duty to look at every individual and see whether you actually are qualified to run or not. Now, that's what the IEC has done. Mm -hmm. The IEC has called out the situation for what, it, what they believe it is, and then the court agrees with them. The, I mean, case closed. Now, if somebody wants to pull the Mamburinjai case or Alaji Sisa case, I get it. But it's only, that's only going to be relevant if Mamburinjai, Mamburinjai actually tries to run for parliament, yes. and the IEC now approves his uh, candidacy, uh, and uh, in quote unquote violation of the law, yes. and then that case goes to the Supreme Court. I mean, I wish, wish, I mean, somebody can take the case to the Supreme Court yes. and then challenge that situation. Now you can make the comparison because you are, now you are comparing apples and apples. Yes. But it, it, so if, if you, you want to scold the borough for hiring these folks because you quote unquote believe they are not supposed to be hired based on the uh, recommendations of the Journal Commission? The same report, it. yes. I get that argument. But that doesn't mean that the IEC, what they did is illegal or wrong or anything for that matter. Their job is to hold everyone who wants to run for office to account by making sure that you can actually run. If Mamburinjai goes there, then we'll watch how he's going to be treated by the IEC. If they treat him any different, then people can now compare these two and say, wait a minute, what, what about Mamburinjai? But he hasn't run for office. And the IEC hasn't looked at any case regarding that matter, as far as he's concerned. Same thing with Alagi Sise. How can you compare these two? You bring that issue into this one and say, oh, because they are hired by the government in some other you know, department, yes. Yes. that the IEC should just let this one violate the constitution and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and run uh, for office. Mm -hmm. it, 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 the, the argument just doesn't hold any water, because these are two totally separate issues. The, the case before the IEC is what the IEC can judge and can call out and can rule on, which is what? 
Momo de Sabali's case. Ask Momo Ndiaye to run for office and then get gets to face the IEC, and then we'll see how the IEC is going to uh, call that one, uh, you know, in, in that situation. But that hasn't happened yet. Until that happens, you cannot use that to say because they are working for government, this one here can now run for parliament. IEC should allow him to run. No. If we want more disabilities to run, guess what we need to do? Let's go in our constitution and change the constitution as we have it. And delete that law. And delete that law. Now, that will make more disabilities eligible to, to, to vote. But, you know, dual citizens. But the, also, the president has, 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 has the prerogative to say, okay, I have forgiven more Is that, does that, does that, does, is that something no, that... No, you see, I'm not, again, I'm not... A, I'm going to law school, but I'm not a legal <laughs> expert in that regard. Yes. To really kind of call, give you analysis on when the president does A, B, C, D, what the law actually means in that regard. Now, uh, I don't know. Maybe if the president pardons him, maybe then because a pardon literally, it does it kind of make you hold again. Yes. It does. Mm -hmm. It kind of, uh, it, it gives you a certain... Well, I would say total immunity. It's almost like you, you never committed a crime. Mm. Pretty much. That's mm -hmm. what it does. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it, it, it pretty much erases it. That's my it own more absorbs you I mean, of, experts can, yeah. uh, you know, uh, correct me on that. But what I am trying to say is this, that if the president does that, possibly it will help to mitigate his case and then he can now be able to run. Now, what the Constitution says about it, I will have to go back and look and ask. And, you know, I think that's a very valid, very relevant question. Yeah. But the point here right now, I mean, that I want to emphasize on is this. Mm -hmm. That those who go to the IEC seeking to, for nominations to run for office are the only ones the IEC can really uh, 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 look at and scrutinize and, you know, uh, speak on. Those who haven't, the IEC cannot. So we cannot be t t taking those who went to the IEC, IEC disqualifies them, and then hold the, and try to call the IEC by simply saying, look, look at that other guy over there, he's uh, in government, so you should allow this one. So you essentially I tell them, violate the constitution because that one guy there has done something that he's not supposed to do. I mean, I, I, I don't know how you can, that up, what about is him? I don't know how you can apply that in this situation because they are two totally different cases, two totally different scenarios. Uh, according to the Constitution, and now confirmed by the Supreme Court of the Gambia, Section 90, Subsection 1E of our Constitution, 1997 Constitution, has disallowed Momo Disability to be able to run for public office. That's what has happened. If we want to fix that, let's go back and change our Constitution, even like dual, dual citizens, even mm -hmm. though that hasn't been challenged in court yet, mm -hmm. maybe when it's challenged and the Supreme Court ruled, rules on it, that's when we will really, it will confirm or it will settle the case. It will become a settled case, uh, uh, you know, uh, as far as that issue is concerned. So that we know whether that's actually the case. But for now, based on our own analysis, and just like we did with Momon Sabah, yeah. is that even people with dual nationalities cannot run. They are disqualified from running. If the IEC court, I mean, again, I, for instance, I try to run for office, and I have all these other requirements met, but I'm a dual, I'm a U.S. citizen. You'll have to denounce that. that. Exactly. IEC can actually say, no, you are disqualified because by virtue of your dual nationality. Now, if I want that changed, I'm gonna, I need to fight them to make sure the Constitution changes that. If it does, hey, barring any other provisions that will stop me from running, now I am allowed to run. But this is not the case. So we can, I cannot sit here and say, oh, so you're going to do that to me? What about that other guy over there who is a dual, national, a dual citizen and he's now a minister, uh, but the, the constitution doesn't allow him to be a minister. So you should allow me to run for, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. But who can hire a, somebody who is a dual citizen as a minister in violation of the constitution and the IEC can turn around and reject my nomination for parliament because I'm a dual citizen. Yep. You go call Barrow out on his act, but you don't insist that the IEC rectifies quote unquote that injustice by simply allowing me to run in violation of the constitution. It doesn't work like that, Lamy. It doesn't. So now let's turn to the issue of the National Assembly uh, elections. I mean, in about a week, um, Gambians will queue again, this time, to vote for their representatives. Um, 
a lot of candidates over 250 people are scrambling <laughs> for the for the for the votes really all the parties are making their moves what would be the uh, type of national assembly that you would want to see i know you have people that are calling for a competent national assembly competent officials competent representatives where where, where do you want to see the next national assembly in terms of competence you know with, with these things there is a wish and there is a reality Yes. Yeah, democracy is the reality. Okay? Yes. Your wish is your wish. Wish meaning what? People, a lot of people wish that we have this good, good, good parliament, meaning good in what, by what definition? Obviously, we have to define yeah. that. Yeah. Because good to me and good to you may not be two different things. Mm -hmm. Good to you may mean if you're an MPP member, all, all of the MPP <laughs> candidates winning. And good to UDP members would mean all of them being UDP members and good to do maybe, maybe that. But what I think good in this regard is that many people will want to see there are quality candidates that people see as quality candidates people that they believe are articulate based on their history they seem they seem to be very articulate they seem to understand the rules they seem to understand have a, at least a good nice basic understanding of law and how it works they seem to have uh, to also have a civic take their civic responsibility very seriously they've been engaged uh, in many, many activities that seem to suggest that they, are very, they, they care deeply about co their communities and the issues that affect their communities. This is what I mean by good candidates. So by, for, for those ones to win, uh, that would be a great thing for our democracy because they will go there and challenge, obviously, the executive and make sure that every bill, every spending bill, every you know act that the parliament wants passed or what have you is fully scrutinized and a, a robust conversation or discussion or debate, for that matter, takes place around these things that are very critical to you know the success of our country. This is what many people uh, would would like to see from my own you know uh, I would say observation. What well, democracy dictates otherwise. Did Obviously, parties will go out and fight for votes. And for them, they want all, all their candidates to win. As far as personally, if you, visit, if, if you want to ask me personally, I have candidates in all the parties that I would like to see win. I really do. Mm -hmm. So my liking for candidates really in this, uh, or my wish, and that's why what I meant by wish, mm -hmm. my <laughs> wish is that these candidates, really all of them win because I think they are good quality yes. candidates. And they are all over the place. Some are in UDP, some are in NPP, some are in DOI, some are in other parties. I mean, the GDC, they are all over the place, really. Um, but again, democracy, you know. You don't have control over how, yeah, how citizens are going to vote. vote but but, but I, Sidi Ajata wants to go back to parliament. President Barrow doesn't. President Barrow is saying he's too old, he's step, he should step aside. And that has really triggered a little anger uh, in, in Doi. Uh, even Halifa Salah was, was attacking the president. I mean, they, they said he was responding. They don't, they hate me to call it an attack. They said I should just say that he was just responding. But he was fighting. Bottom of the, the fact of the matter is he was fighting CDS fight. What is your take on that? The president swiping at... Uh, what the president said, that's what politicians do. You have to get a job at your opponent. As long as it's respectful. You know, look, just yes. to say that, oh, this one, he <laughs> should retire now. Well, your friend said it was disrespectful. <laughs> coach Pasamba. Well, I mean, look, <laughs> coach is a doy. Uh, again, I see why he will say what he said. Because he's a doy. Yes. And so if you attack his candidate, he will come out there and defend him. And defend him. So I can, you know, like I am second day, yes. coach will do, I can see him doing the same thing, going after Barrow and yes. trying to, you know, uh, stick it, back to it. That's the beauty of democracy. Yes. I think, that, you see, for me, that's the culture is where I always want to put the emphasis. And we always, always, Lamy, in these mm -hmm. conversations, lose sight of that fact. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's insisting that we all talk a certain way, act a certain way, behave a certain way, and approach these things with a certain look. And no, democracy, in fact, that would be totally anti-democratic. It doesn't work like that. Democracy, a democratic, in a democratic environment, people have different opinions. They have different ways of the way they look at things. And sometimes, I mean, all the time, parties do take a job at each other. You know, this like people, I mean, would be for me if he had insulted him, you know, something like that. But to say that, look, CDS will retire, I'm sorry to DOI members, but hey. It's he, normal. It's, it's a normal democratic speech. And it's, it's, I don't, look, I don't blame Barrow for his vow, you know, 
he's vouching for his candidate. He's fighting for his candidate. That, that's what politicians that's do. What, politicians, what, what do you expect him to do? Right, right. So, and for Doi to come out, really took a swing at him back. Wonderful. And, and, and I understand that, it was Sidia who, right. who started the fight, who said that the government has been overrun by <laughs> monkeys and baboons. Uh, and, and, then, and then the issue of, um, of, 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 of the roads, the URR roads and bridges came by way of charity, begging, begging. Yeah. You know? Um, I love so, it. Yeah, so I mean. Uh, Look, I'm glad Sidia said that because that's what he's supposed to do. Let him take, I mean, take a swing at Barrow and his and NPP big time. Let him, let him not spare them because this is really it's it's election season. Let him not take any prisoners. That's what you do. That's what politicians yes. politicians so, look, do. It's okay. That, People I, just need to chill and recognize that politicians are doing what they're supposed to do. This is wonderful for our democracy. And you have the president's campaign also much criticized. You have people like D.A. Jao saying the president was abusing state resources. This is a political tour. He should not have used state resources. Right. I think, look, that's a fair criticism. If Barrow is using government resources to run a political campaign, Absolutely. I think that's a fair, fair, fair criticism. But his media chief is saying the president is at least entitled to certain privileges like security as head of state, like security, like, like vehicles to, to carry the security I, I, people. I totally agree with that. If the president is traveling, because that is totally tied to our own national security. So obviously, if he is even going on a campaign tour, absolutely, our security apparatus should be there to protect him. Now, somebody can agree or disagree with whether that trip is necessary or not. You know, again, these are all things that you can criticize the president on and say, hey, yeah, we get it. You are supposed to protect it, but uh, the timing of these things, why are you always traveling well, to these places knowing that our resources will be used to protect you and then go after him for it? Wonderful for our democracy. Let's go ahead and have these debates. Let's continue to have these conversations. Those who don't agree with Barrow and how he's approaching things, like D.A. Jao just did, by all means, Go out there and say it. Let's, let's have a conversation. Let's have a debate about this thing. It's going to enrich our democracy. It's going to make us a better country. And it's going to help us to be able to achieve that country of our dreams, I mean. That's exactly what this is all about. Let us never, ever, under any circumstance, lose sight of that fact, that, that aspect of things. Mm -hmm. I think we tend to, everybody wants things to be done your way. It's people to talk your way. To say what you want them to say. I'm sorry. In a democracy, this is exactly how it works. People will take a swing at each other. Political parties will take a swing at each other. Everybody will express their opinions, whether you agree with it or not. If you don't agree, well, hey, bring your case and take a swing at them and disagree. One thing also that has uh, caused uh, a row is the granting of amnesty to Sana Savali. Uh, 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 denying people like former Vice President Dr. Esurinjai Seri. What's your view on that? No, look, I haven't, we haven't heard from the government side yet. You know, this is the TR, TRRC recommendation you're talking about. Yes. But no, yes, I also have a problem. In fact, we, we had a conversation about this, and mm -hmm. I have a serious problem with granting amnesty to Sana Sabali. But I've always said this. I mean, during the course of that TRRC, those, the, the hearings, I raised the alarm. I even went to my Facebook page and wrote about this. Because the way I saw the TRRC, the way they were hobnobbing Sana, and even the general public, let's, let's remember, look, this is not the TRRC, just the TRRC alone. Even the general public, Sana became an instant celebrity. Among, instant among citizens. Among citizens. Yes. Among his, his citizens. You saw it. Mm -hmm. People were taking pictures with Someone him. who accepted to superintendering the murder of at least a dozen yeah. military officers. They called him a hero. They celebrated him. They were celebrating him. And I was sitting there watching this, and I'm like, how? Why? I mean, have you forgotten? But you know, as a country, I think this is where our mistakes come in. Sometimes we don't, I don't know whether we, we, we know what we really want. Because we want one thing, and then we act a totally different way. As far as, why well, can we be insisting on having justice? And then really behaving that way towards a, a perpetrator of these very, very, very serious crimes. Let the courts decide these things. Let them go to court. If a court comes back and says, hey, Sana has fully cooperated, Sana did this, already, so because of that, we reward him with AB. Look, I mean, I'm willing to live with that. I, I, look, victims' families will have their say on this. 
and uh, you know, and, and, and we should always, always be sensitive to their concerns. Finally, and, cost and of we, living. We cost of living. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody is talking about it. People are, people are really concerned about the issue of cost of living. Mm -hmm. What is your view? What do you think is the cause of this? I, look, I think it's a global trend. And also, maybe I, I do also believe that there are missteps on the government side. Government needs to go back and revisit these pricing schemes. And not only that, but also revisit the, their economic policies. Look, I mean, I hate this sounds you know, phobic here. But we have a situation where look at all the major industries in this country and all the major imports and everything. Our market is controlled literally by people that literally are not even from here. Non-Gambians. So, Non-Gambians. This is what is happening. And so for those people, obviously they are businessmen and women, and they are driven solely by profit. I get it. But then if they can abuse the, the, their profit scheme, and instead of making 100%, they can make 500% because we don't have any alternatives. What I mean, al mean by alternative meaning, they are the only ones we can buy from. We cannot go elsewhere. We don't have a choice but to pay that 500% increase. So this is where the problem is. I think government needs to make sure they prioritize also the, the, the open up the market and allow Gambians to come in and operate in these markets and you know become major players also. Because let, let's, let me give you an example, and you can call this a free ad by me. <laughs> I, you know, I just opened a branch of Magellac stores in Brufford. Yes. I, you know, we sell meat, chicken, you know, um, fish, and all these things right, right at the Brufford market. People are selling over there meat, meat and bone for $300. Again, go there, you will find out that the market is controlled by foreigners. Mm -hmm. When, uh, you know, I opened that store over there, guess what, how much I'm selling the meat for? $290 per kilo. $10 in discount. Yes. Because to me, I want to make sure that the locals, look, that not, may not be enough, obviously, because the profit margin is thin. Mm -hmm. If I could get a bigger profit margin, uh, I would yeah, have shared course. it more you would have, you would with have. the customers. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm saying, because for me, I'm looking at my community and saying, no, $300 is too much for meat and bone. I can do better. Let me do $290. Mm -hmm. Maybe that extra $10, they can use that to, you know, buy something, uh, yes. maybe onion mm -hmm. or, 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 or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What, all I'm saying is this, that I, I have my community at the back of my mind. How do I also serve their interests here? But because I'm from there. A guy who doesn't is not from there and probably is just to gather as much money as possible and send it back home may not have those considerations, may not even care. So what I'm saying is we need to open, I'm not saying kick out the foreigners, let them stay and do business. But let's open the market. Let's provide capital to Gambians. We, many Gambians want to do business, they just don't have access to capital. They cannot do these things. Mm -hmm. They cannot become major importers. They cannot, well, and those who are importing, even Gambians that are importing, they literally are, are struggling in this economy. They are having problems. You have a lot of Gambians that can do so much in this country, Lamin, and they are just not getting the access. Government needs to go back and take care of that. Look, this price increase, even in the United States, the prices have shot into the sky. So some of it is not their fault at all. Trust me, this is a global problem. It's a global trend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying, UK, you remember, I mean, I remember recently there have been news articles yeah. about this, mm -hmm. UK. But what I'm saying is government, for government to play its role significantly in this and have an impact, they need to go back and make sure that they empower Gambians and get open up the market, make sure that the impediments that are there, the issue of having to bribe this, bribe that, that Gambians generally tend to refuse to do, and, not, and now they get shut down and shut out of the system, or you know, you create all these impediments for them, rule crazy rules, make it difficult for them to operate and do get into the market, so that it just stays within some few hands. This is what government needs to revisit these policies, look at them very carefully, and come in with a view to making sure that they, like I said, open the market for Gambians to enter and do business and bring about the big transformational change that needs to happen in this country. We and only we can do it, and we are ready. We want to do it, let them open the market and allow us and, and we will do it. Mr. Mane? I can guarantee you. Many, many thanks for joining me on my show tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We've run out of time. Um, thank you very much for coming uh, once again. So uh, we, with that, we'll come to the end of the show tonight. I will be back on Monday. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>